and thank you so much for attending tonight's presentation. My name is Mark Klopach Mathias, and I'm here representing two of tonight's sponsors, including the University of Wisconsin River Falls Office of Sustainability and Hope for Creation. In addition to those two sponsors, our other sponsors include Powerful Choices and our host, the River Falls Public Library. We are very, very thankful for all of these sponsors working collaboratively in our community to make tonight's event a reality and this entire series a reality. If anyone in the audience would like to get in touch with any of these organizations, please feel free to email me at sustainability at uwrf.edu and we can help get you connected. Before we get into tonight's presentation, I would like to highlight the next events in the Sustainability Speaker Series. Our next event will be on March 31st at 6 p.m. featuring Diana L. Futh from the University of Wisconsin Extension talking about sustainable landscaping. We will then have another event on April 21st at 6 p.m. featuring Dr. Christy Manning from McAllister College speaking on the mental health impacts of our changing climate. Please mark your calendars for both of those events. We're very excited to have both of those speakers with us and it'll be a great way to finish out our series in March and April. While the following event is not part of the series through the library, it involves many of the same sponsors for tonight's, for tonight's event, uh, and it really features sustainability within our broader community. The event is EarthFest 2022, which will be held at Glen Park on Sunday, April 24th from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. EarthFest 2022 is a free community celebration of past, present, and future sustainability efforts in River Falls and the surrounding area. This family-friendly event includes live music, fun family activities, food sampling, a sustainability fair, free giveaways, and much more. Again, be sure to mark your calendars for Sunday, April 24th from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Without further ado, I would like to hand things over to our two presenters tonight. Molly and Heather will each introduce themselves. Molly will then talk a little bit more about the UW Climate Divestment Coalition, and Heather will follow that with perspectives from the St. Croix Valley Foundation. We will save all questions until the end. However, you can enter them in the comments or chat sections as we go, and we will be able to capture those for later on. Molly, would you like to start by introducing yourself? Thank you, Mark. Hi, everyone. I am Molly. I am a current senior at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point studying natural resource planning and I'm the co-founder of the UW Divestment Coalition. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Molly. Uh, pleased to be here. I'm Heather Loglin, president of the St. Croix Valley Foundation. And um, while the work of our foundation covers a large region, including Pearson St. Croix counties, some of you who are watching may know that I have a soft spot in, spot in my heart for River Falls. I spent 12 years working for Alina Health at the hospital in River Falls and had the pleasure of getting to know some of the people and organizations who are involved with and sponsoring tonight's event. So um, delighted to be here. I also do feel like I need to start with a bit of a disclaimer, um, perhaps a strange one for a guest speaker, which is this topic is not my area of expertise. I am not a financial advisor. I do not have a degree in finance. Uh, my hope and the request when, when folks reached out to ask me to be part of tonight's program is really just that by sharing my experience as a staff member leading an organization that recently navigated its entry into the socially responsive investing world, um, that maybe I can help you as a non-expert get a little bit more comfortable with some of the some of the concepts, some of the terminology, um, some of the challenges, and and possibly make you feel a bit comfortable about about pushing or dipping your own toes into this world, even though you you are not an expert um, in investments. So that's my disclaimer, and I'm delighted to to be part of this conversation tonight with Molly. Thanks. All right, yeah, thank you um, both for those introductions. And I'm gonna get us started with our first presentation on UW Coalition. So let me share my screen. Okay. All right. So as I said, I am Molly and I co-founded the UW Divestment Coalition 
in March of 2020. Um, and as I said, I'm a student from UW Stevens Point, um, but this coalition represents students and campuses from all across the state um, with River Falls included. And so that's how I started, sort of ended up here tonight. Um, but so, so what is divestment? What is this term that we keep throwing around? Um, so basically divestment, what we refer to specifically in the UW system and this concept overlays in terms of your your personal bank accounts and um, you know for other nonprofit organizations but basically um, it's when we are pulling our investments out of companies that are considered unethical um, in this case fossil fuels um, so in the past there have been other divestment movements or efforts um, similar to the fossil fuel divestment campaigns such as the south south african apartheid uh, movement that was big in like the 1970s and 80s. Um, UW-Madison actually was pretty um, pivotal in leading that effort. And then there's also been efforts um, to divest from tobacco, Palestine, and currently um, there's efforts against the prison industrial complex. Um, so when, here, I'll go back up here. So specifically when I refer to divestment at the, we'll do it this way, at the UW campus level, Here's what I want to see. So, um, so at each of the universities, we have a um, foundation, and these foundations are the the nonprofit organizations that work with the university and manage our donations on behalf of the universities. So, if I, for example, wanted to donate a hundred thousand dollars to UW River Falls because I love the campus, that is amazing. However, um, we take those funds and we don't invest them directly into the school. We take them and invest them first to grow the funds, to put them back into the university, to um, pay for the basic operational costs um, th th over the years. So, um, but when we take those funds, we are investing them in companies such as BP and Exxon um, Mobil and as as a whole system, as, as campuses, um, this is a lot of funds that add up over time. Um, and so we estimate um, through our, our research that it's about $7 billion in total that a foundation uh, or that all of the UW foundations um, have invested. Um, and typically an endowment has about two to 5% invested in fossil fuels. Um, and so this would mean around um, 250 million-ish dollars um, that we estimate are invested in fossil fuel related companies. So going back, um, there have, as I said before, the, the fossil fuel movement is not just something that's occurring in the state of Wisconsin. Um, it's been going on all across the US and all across the globe. Um, there's been over 100 campuses that have successfully divested from fossil fuels currently. Um, most notably, um, University of Michigan and Minnesota have both in the last, like, within the last year and a half, two years, they've both divested. Um, and so UW is really falling behind um, other strong uh, Midwest campuses. And then right here in April 2020, over a thousand institutions and 58,000 uh, individuals have um, divested, representing 14 trillion in assets worldwide. Um, so yeah, as I said, like as I I represent divestment on the campus level perspective. However, divestment can look different um, for different organizations and individuals, and, um, and there's a lot of different ways to pull out funds from fossil fuels. So um, I'm not going to go through this this whole list, but um, some of the main arguments that we we typically like to to point out for divestment, um, I always I always like to point out the fact that as universities, as a student, um, we we are the the purpose of a, of a campus is to promote the future and promote um, education to better the state um, of Wisconsin and really just better better the world, right? That's why we offer this education. And so we are directly going against that mission by investing in companies that are directly negatively impacting um, our, our livelihoods, our future, um, you know, as Wisconsin starts to, has really um, experienced the impacts of climate change, this really goes against the, um, the mission of the campus as they serve. Um, so 
Um, I also want to say that River Falls and the area that you all are um, in with some of the the, the line five and stop line three protests up, up north and um, the pushback against new fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, as we are choosing to invest in fossil fuel companies, we are choosing to support this new infrastructure that's going in. Um, and so we're not just, you know, going to our gas tank and filling up and supporting, you know, gas or supporting oil today, right? But by making these investments, we are talking about um, supporting fossil fuel companies for a, a much farther out future, 30 to 50 years, um, at least that we are, that these funds will be put towards um, these new infrastructure investments. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind as well, um, that it really does have an impact. And it's not um, like your actions now make really large impacts for for later on. Um, I mean, I guess the only last thing I would say with this is the fact that, um, as many are aware, renewable energy is kicking some butt and um, we are really in this transition mode right now. And how can we expect ourselves to transition if we're still investing in um, these less desirable energy um, opportunities when we have these new ones that are really moving forward and, you know, the, the state can become a lot less energy dependent on bringing in fossil fuels. Um, so some a little bit more of the financials. Um, so over, you know, maybe like 15 years ago, it would have been less, less of a argument to say that fossil fuels aren't, aren't, um, are a smart financial decision. But today we have a lot of data that's proven that it's not only, you know, morally good to divest from fossil fuels, but it's also financially better for the individual and for a, an organization as well. Um, so we met with a professor from UC Berkeley for the campaign, and she gave us a lot of statistics. And so that's where these have come from, in case you're wondering. Um, but so basically, this graph here is showing um, the S&P 500 companies um, in the blue and how much their um, return level per percent changes. And you can see that when you isolate Chevron and Exxon, um, they're not performing nearly as well as these other S&P 500 companies. Um, and so this is just a, a simple visual to show, um, but it adds to the, the weight. Um, another one, another visual that we were given that is helpful is again to show that, yeah, back in the 1980s, it would have been, whoops, it would have been um, smart to invest in fossil fuels, you know, t t eight out of, or seven out of 10 of these top companies um, were related to oil. And as over the years, we, we've sort of made this transition. Um, and so, um, ooh, excuse me. <laughs> but um, one other thing I want to mention related to this is we, over the summer as part of our campaign, um, and I'll get into this part more later, but we, um, we submitted a complaint to the attorney general of the state, and we received a response from the, the Department of Financial Institutions, and um, they were in support of all, organizations being conscious of climate conditions and how that impacts investments. Um, and so this is a conversation at the state level, at the private level, um, you know, at the individual level um, as well. So, um, oh yeah, so this also, this kind of just connects to what I was saying before, how we are choosing to, you know, make our investments are not just having, you know, impacts on, you know, yourself, but it has impacts on um, these marginalized communities, um, especially line three, um, as we know that pipelines spill and we are um, damaging these already marginalized communities that are going to continue to be um, really impacted severely by climate change. Um, and so just by not contributing to the already worsened conditions that they are experiencing and are going to continue to be experiencing, um, through divesting. Um, so specifically with the UW system, the way that it's set up, we have 13 campuses um, and each of, the, each of the campuses has their own foundation, uh, right? Um, so UW River Falls has their own, where I attend at UW Stevens Point, they have their own. Um, however, um, and some of some of them, it's 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 complicated because there's not a lot of transparency around how the endowment gets managed, what they are investing in. Um, they are not required to give these reports, um, 
And that's because of this relationship. So the UW Foundation, like, or each of the foundations um, at, at the campuses is considered a nonprofit organization that is separate from the university. Um, so they have this relationship where the funds get donated to the schools, given to the foundations. However, um, they are, the universities do not have say over how they make their investment decisions. Um, and so, and, and the universities also, to my knowledge, cannot require that transparency to be public. Um, it also can be kind of confusing too, because endowments are changing constantly, like what they are investing in, um, different funds and, um, and different, you know, different companies. It, it's very complicated, especially when your endowment is, especially for the UW Foundation down in Madison, it's $4 billion. And so um, warranted for them, it is harder to be transparent. Um, and so it makes things more confusing for us to know fully where the money is going, how it's getting used, um, and how we can transition away from those if we don't even know what we are currently investing in. Um, so yeah, currently none of our universities in the UW system have divested from fossil fuels, um, but there's there's been progress to poke at each of the, the foundations um, through our organization. Um, so yeah, because of the way that the UW system is set up, um, we decided that we would form a coalition of students from across the state to provide um, collective resources um, as some students, some universities have more active student bodies than others. Um, some foundations were, were more receptive than others. Um, and so we were collective as a, um, as a 13 campuses. We also work collectively because some university endowments get taken to um, the UW Foundation down in Madison. So um, River Falls, this isn't the case, but for Stevens Point, um, the Stevens Point Foundation actually does not manage our endowment. Um, it gets taken down to Madison to get managed by other financial experts. Um, and so um, when I spoke to my foundation, they were like, yeah, we don't even have any control over that. Um, it goes down to Madison. And so um, it was really necessary to have this sort of like joint effort. Um, and it's been really helpful for us, I think, in our longevity and progress. Um, so yeah, um, our, our basic mission as a divestment coalition is to unite the universities throughout the University of Wisconsin system to demand a just divestment from fossil fuels to combat the crisis, the climate crisis. Um, so to sort of go with that, that's what I was just sort of talking about, why we work together at the state level. Okay, this is what I was looking for. Um, so with that, we have three main goals. Um, so the first one is, is, as I was discussing before, is to get that transparency about what we are investing in from each of the foundations um, and so that we can be aware of that and monitor that and also just sort of like track their progress. Um, with divestment campaigns in the past, there's been issues of universities or organizations say like, oh yeah, like we're divesting. Um, however, divestment is a, is a transitional process and it takes three to five years. And so just sort of the transparency is really helpful to keep them accountable. Um, and instead of it just being sort of this like fluff um, word that we're, that we're throwing around around divesting, um, that it's making sure that's actually tangibly happening. Um, so then, yeah, that, that is our second one is to actually have the divestment process get started. Um, and then the third one is hopefully to be reinvesting in uh, companies that will be promoting instead a more sustainable future for the state of Wisconsin. Um, I also want to point out this image, uh, some of these images on the right. I don't think I've pointed them out yet, but um, so as students across the state, we um, one of the things we do is direct actions. And so this is just one of our key um, events that we do called banner drops. And so there's some students um, on campuses talking to other students, educating them on the fact that our universities are investing in fossil fuels. Um, so yeah, um, in terms of what we've done thus far um, as a campaign, this is why it's really great to work collectively. Um, Zoom has actually been super amazing for us. COVID was like kind of a blessing for this because suddenly students were so interested in one, like sitting on a Zoom screen with people they never met people had time and I think people were antsy and like wanted to do something because of 
just the state of the world. And so um, this is just a, a list of some of the things we've done. So um, the first step was sort of passing these, these resolutions that go through our campuses. Um, we have faculty and student ones. Um, we've also had a variety of media coverage. Um, I can, I'll show some more on our website in a bit. Um, as I mentioned before, we filed a legal complaint to the state attorney general. Um, this was basically a attempt to say that um, there's actually this law in Wisconsin law stating um, that it's actually illegal for the universities to be investing in companies um, that go against their mission. And so um, sadly, there was a gap in the law that did not give um, any authority to an entity to do something about this. Um, and so it's it left us at sort of a, a weird um, end road in that complaint. But um, as I said, the Department of Financial Institutions was very supportive of our campaign. Um, we also heard from, we also were included in the Wisconsin State Climate Task Force. Um, they, through their report that they issued about transitioning the state into more sustainable development options. Um, they mentioned having uh, the universities and other nonprofits divest from fossil fuels. Um, we also spent a lot of our time meeting with foundations, just sort of asking questions, learning what the challenges are, um, you know, making our, ourselves known. Um, and then we also have had over 700 petition signatures um, as a campaign. I think you've got to have the petition. Um, uh, one other thing that we have been doing recently is attending Board of Regents meetings. Um, and so the Board of Regents are this overhead umbrella representative group of the UW system and um, sort of trying to, we've been attending their public meetings to to have that presence. Um, and we've been moving forward with meeting them and trying to find ways that they can use their um, power to leverage to convince these foundations um, to divest. So um, what else are we working on in our campaign? So we are as I said, we're, we're doing those Board of Regents meetings, um, continuing our direct actions. And I think honestly, just the way I see it is like continuing the longevity, um, continuing to show that like this is an effort from across the state, that it is really not just students, there are faculty, there are community members, there are alumni, um, and that people are, are interested in having us transition away. Um, and so just continuing that, that consistent pressure um, I think also, um, as I, I, this campaign got started two years ago, I'm about to graduate. So just sort of transitioning in younger students, getting people educated. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's sort of where we are right now for the UW Divestment Coalition. Um, I've kind of mentioned some of these before, but as like a recap of some of the, the, the largest things that we face as a campaign. Um, so our, our biggest struggle is the fact these, that these foundations are considered private entities um, and that the, they technically do not have to listen to what the, the university chancellors say, to what the, the UW Board of Regents say. Um, and so it leaves us, they don't really have to listen to us as students. Um, and so it just leaves us in this weird um, position of finding who, who, who can help us. Um, and then, as I said before, the UW Board of Regents up until recently has not been interested in meeting with us um, or taking us seriously, but that has recently been taking a turn, which is great. Um, and then as students graduate, that's always an issue. And then also just coordinating between um, so many foundations and so many campuses. Um, I wanted to specifically um, state a little bit about River Falls. Um, so with River Falls, we have met with their foundation. Um, Janet, um, we met with her last April and she was in support um, and thought that fossil fuel divestment was a, a good idea. And um, however, since there hasn't been a lot of action taken, um, at the end, I'll let Mark talk a little bit more about what, um, what actions they've taken on their campus to push for that a little bit. Um, but there hasn't been too much, too much activity. Um, so how can you take action? So I'm actually going to um, pull and pull out a different web page for us. So um, the first thing I would think to do is to go to our website. So this is the UW um, Divestment Coalition 
website and it has all the details in case you forgot everything that I just said. <laughs> it's all pretty much here. Um, and we have a fact page, um, but you can sign our petition. Um, and then if you are involved specifically with the university um, or an alumni, something with the UW system, um, you can actually write to your university's foundation and to the administrators. Um, if you are a student um, or a recently graduated student, um, you can join the coalition and become involved in many different capacities. If you have a little bit more money in your pockets and you really think that this is a great campaign, um, we would love donations. We will use this for our direct actions, for supplies, for um, driving to events, um, to going to conferences. Um, so yeah, that's always really helpful or even just paying to, to have this website, you know. Um, but yeah, you can keep up on our website. We usually have, oh, also at the bottom we have um, a, we, you can get added to our mailing list and keep up to date on just sort of what we've been working on. And um, this tab is also really helpful if you're interested in learning more about the campaign. Um, you can read some of our articles that we've written or ones that have been written about us. Um, and then also, if you have Instagram, this is one of the easiest ways as well to be aware of the campaign and to learn about different actions that are going on. Um, this has a lot of our most up-to-date information um, related to what we're working on. Um, so this was recently from a Board of Regents meeting that we attended. Um, and next, our, our main big action is um, the Board of Regents are going to be at um, UW-Stevens Point, and um, a portion of the meeting is about sustainability, and we'll be able to talk to them and present about um, the importance of fossil fuel divestment. Um, yeah, so I can, um, yeah, that's that's pretty much what I had. Um, I will, oh, I got to go back. Okay, now I'm back. Um, yeah, so thank you all for, for listening. I'm Molly, and yeah. So Molly, I'm guessing I'm not the only one wondering. Um, the orange hats. What's the yeah. behind the orange hats? Oh, yes. Okay, I should explain that. So with the fossil fuel divestment campaign, the, um, the whole, the movement is like the the image of the movement is this orange X. And so we actually got this idea from Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt has a really fun poppy campaign going on and they wear their orange hats for like every action that they've ever done. Mm -hmm. And so we ordered like 60 of these hats, which is great if people want to donate because they would go towards stuff like that. Um, we ordered 60 hats and it like really just helps when we're at these Board of Regents meetings because then they're like, oh, this is what these students are here for. And it looks like this very cohesive group. Yeah. Very smart. Thanks. Thank you. So, Mark, are you jumping back in or should I just take it away? If he doesn't jump back in, I will take it away. Okay, I'll run with it. So thanks, Molly. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the St. Croix Valley Foundation's journey with socially responsive investing, um, including a little allude to um, the whole divestment question. So for those of you who don't know, um, the St. Croix Valley Foundation, and if we can um, share my screen, beautiful, thank you. Um, the St. Croix Valley Foundation is a 25-year-old community foundation that serves the, the, the communities up and down the river, basically. So St. Croix, um, Pierce, Polk, and Burnett counties here in Wisconsin, and then Washington and Chisago counties on the, middle, um, on the Minnesota side of the river. Uh, our mission is to enhance quality of life in the St. Croix Valley. So pretty broad mission. We really do that by focusing on generosity and grant making. So we encourage uh, charitable giving. We connect those dollars with the programs that are doing good work here in the Valley and really try to bring people together to work collaboratively in response to the challenges facing our region. Um, in addition to our organization, which covers the entire six counties, we do support as part of our organization, 10 local community affiliates, including the River Falls Community Foundation, which was uh, founded in 1999. So we have about 500 philanthropic funds 
Um, total assets coming up on a hundred million, so nowhere near the the seven billion that that Molly referenced, but a hundred million dollars, uh, which enables us to grant about five million dollars a year, primarily to programs right here in the valley. And in general, we do focus on endowed funds. So Molly talked about how that seven billion dollars. Um, donors gift those dollars, and many of them are actually endowed. So folks have said, um, I don't actually want you to spend my gift. I want you to invest my gift, and then I want you to spend or use the, the earnings on this gift forever every year to help make good things happen. Um, so those forever gifts, those forever funds, they are invested for the long haul. Um, and typically you'll see foundations using between four and 6% maybe um, each year for grants. And really the power of endowment then is that, um, you know, for some folks, if they're going to make a $100,000 gift, they want to see $100,000 of impact right now. And that's often transformational. That often helps a building get built, a new food shelf get built. It helps um, a church expand. Um, other folks love the fact that um, there is power in um, the power of compounding interest. So you make a $100,000 gift today. And over the course of 20 years with, with, with prudent investment and management, you'll have granted more than $100,000 out of earnings and you'll have more than $100,000 still left of that gift. And so that's this power of endowment that, that, that Molly's talking about at the university level is that it's a lot of dollars that are invested to help generate the smaller dollars that are granted each year. And so... Um, the, 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 the question that comes up then that comes from donors is it's great that your organization is pushing four and a half percent out every year into the community to make good things happen. But what about the other 95.5 percent? What about the dollars that you're investing? Are you making good things happen with those dollars? And that really is the question that more and more foundations have been considering um, sometimes very proactively, sometimes in response to um, pressure or suggestions from, from student groups, or in our case, we had some fund advisors who, who came to us um, with information about what some other community foundations were doing with their 95.5%, with their you know, with all of their endowed assets um, and ways that they were looking at doing some more socially responsive investing. And so we were lucky enough to... Um, uh, have a partner, our investment advisor fund evaluation group um, is, is very experienced with socially responsive investing. And um, because uh, per my disclaimer at the beginning, I am not a financial advisor, um, I'm, not, I'm not an accountant. Um, we had that expert help to walk with us, walk the board through at a retreat in uh, November of 2019 um, through the process of developing at least a little bit of a shared base understanding of this responsive investing terminology. And um, you know what what we what we started with is this is not something new. And in fact, um, it was kind of fun as I was preparing for for this conversation, um, I found a resource online, the history of socially responsive investing. Um, and it goes way, way back, right? So for a long time, people have thought about how do we put our money to good work. Um, more recently, you know, I can recall as a new grad, new college grad in the early 90s, um, Dom and I had a socially responsive investment option for people. At that point, though, the thought was still, if you're going to do the right thing, you need to be willing to sacrifice returns. And so people really were weighing this whole like, okay, I know I need to plan and be, be prudent, be financially smart. And yet in my heart, I'm saying, but how can I, how can I feel okay about having dollars invested in X, Y, or Z? So, so fast forward, fast forward to today, what we're learning, and Molly talked about this a bit looking at S&P returns, um, is that we really have gotten to the point with socially responsive investment options where people are no longer having to sacrifice returns to have investments that match up with their values. Um, and so that's, um, when, you know, when we look at responsive investing, the growth there, you know, you can see the growth in funds and dollars invested responsibly um, over the past, the past five years. I think what's important to highlight here, and we'll just touch on it, and then I'll put some links um, 
Well, I don't have a chat to put links into. We'll have to figure out a way to share with you. I, well, I guess I can put it into that into that chat um, um, if you want to look at this. But some terminology. So Molly has really been talking about um, socially responsive investments, um, SRI. Um, and that is when you tend to talk more about SIN stocks or um as Molly said, divesting from things, you know, so you look at a portfolio and you say, we don't want to be invested in a certain type of product because of our values, you know, and so you typically see categories like, yes, oil, but tobacco, um, pornography, you know, you, you uh, an organization based on its values will say, we want to make sure we don't have this in our portfolio. We don't have want to have these sin stocks. Um, the, the other term that you'll encounter and the direction that our board ended up going at the recommendation of our advisors is this environmental, social, and governance approach, or ESG. And this is an approach that um, isn't perfect because, yes, in an ESG portfolio, you can still have fossil fuels. What they're going to do, though, is they're going to look at those companies and they're going to choose the ones that score highest when you look at environmental, social, and governance aspects of their business operations. And, and those are scored, and that's how a, um, an ESG portfolio is put together based on those, on those scores. And so really, um, you know, two, two thoughts, um, two trains of thought. One is don't put your money into something that you know is not aligned with your values. And the other is, isn't it better to engage them and incent them to improve their practices rather than walk away because fossil fuels aren't going away tomorrow. Uh, we hope they're going away maybe eventually, but they aren't going away tomorrow. So again, um, neither right nor wrong, two different approaches to this. Um, and, I, and again, the direction that we as a foundation opted to go was, was down that ESG or environmental, social, and governance road. Um, our board, after after going through this education process and um, hearing from me and from staff that, yes, we had donors, yes, we had fund advisors who were asking about this and hearing from our financial um, investment advisor that, you know what, you no longer have to sacrifice refer returns. In fact, some folks feel, believe that companies that are looking to line up with ESG standards are actually going to perform better. They're going to outperform traditional companies or portfolios because doing these things is actually not only good for your company, it's good for the, for or not only good for the world, it's good for business. And to get a sense for what some of these are, and I apologize because you'll have to turn your head because they're sideways. Um, but here's an example of the kinds of things that um, an investor might rank when putting together an ESG, environmental social governance portfolio. So under the E, um, or I'm sorry, under the S, you might look at things like exposure to tobacco and alcohol or gambling. You might look at, um, you know, are they working with GMOs? Um, under the G, they're gonna look at things like representation of women and people of color on boards. Um, they might look at also HR policies. Do they provide paid leave? Um, that sort of thing. Um, and then obviously the environmental does include some of the measures of exposure to fossil fuels, et cetera. But, but so that's how you put together an ESG portfolio. Now, to be transparent, there is a lot of um, criticism of ESG that it is not perfect. And it is not perfect. Um, in fact, one of our board members, I think, just shared with me um, a recent article from Stanford Social Innovation basically saying, um, how do we make this S real? And the, the example that they gave was uh, that um, British American tobacco has been part of the Dow Jones Sustainability Fund for more than 20 years. It scores well on some of the rankings of uh, board composition, treating employees well, et cetera, but it's tobacco. So how can you say that when it comes to social impact, um, you know, that that's a strong S. And so there is a lot of pressure to clean up, um, to clean up the definitions around ESG, to clean up and be really transparent around the, the scoring for ESG. Um, but the, the interest in this, the interest in socially responsive investing, whether it is, um, you know, portfolios that exclude or divest from certain things, whether it is an ESG portfolio, 
um, whether it is another type of portfolio where you take some of that capital and you make um, mission related investments or program related investments you know that an example of that would be um, a foundation who says rather than you know we're gonna, if we have a hundred million dollars 10 million of it rather than putting it into the market we're actually going to use to provide low or no interest loans to build affordable housing to help um, build minority owned businesses, et cetera. So there are different ways that you could take that that capital and invest it, yes, for financial, but also for social returns. So about a third of all assets under professional management in the US now, more than $17 trillion, are in some sort of socially responsive investment portfolio and looking forward, anticipating the transfer of wealth and the interest of millennials in, in this type of investment option, we really expect that to grow. And so I think we will, yes, see increased dollars going in. Um, and we will also see increased scrutiny about this, this kind of what's being called greenwashing, you know, that um, you can't just stamp yourself ESG and call it good, that we need a better way for folks to really know what this what this is what this ESG product is that they are um, that they are looking at getting into. So after our board retreat in November of um, 2019, the board basically says, "Yep, we can move ahead with this. We're going to let folks opt into it. So fund advisors, we're going to let them opt into it. We can move ahead as long as we can build a, build a portfolio that." we expect to generate comparable returns over time. So again, not willing to give on returns, but willing to start looking at new and different ways to, um, to invest those dollars. So we did launch um, an ESG portfolio with about $25 million, which is what we needed um, to make it be cost neutral for us. We launched that portfolio um, last spring. Um, with one of our investment launch partners. So Carpenter Nature Center is one of the nonprofits whose endowed assets are here at the St. Croix Valley Foundation. Um, you know, they're, they're a nature center. It's not surprisingly, when it, we brought this to their board, when they brought this to their board, their board was very interested in having their assets invested in a socially responsive way through an ESG portfolio. Um, and so they helped us launch this. And at this point, it is something that our fund advisors can opt into um, if, if that's what they would like to, to see their, the, get, the gifts they've made um, invested in. So um, we had a pretty good uptick. Um, we were warned by our, our investment advisor that um, a lot of times folks will say they want this, but when it comes time to actually clicking the button and saying, yep, I'm in, um, you don't always get the opt-in. And we had about 40 funds. So about 10%, I think, of our funds that did opt-in to a socially responsive or an ESG portfolio. My gut is that down the road, as we're, we're able to provide, you know, not month to month or quarter to quarter returns, but as we're able to look at one year, three year, five year returns and presumably show people that, hey, you really are not giving up returns by by shifting to a more responsible um, investment approach that we'll see even more um, of our of our fund advisors opting for this. And to be frank, we hope this will be a reason that folks might choose to partner with the St. Croix Valley Foundation on their philanthropic funds. Um, you know, people who are here in the Valley tend to love this Valley. One of the things that people love about the Valley is our natural resources. And so we hope that by having an investment option for funds that they gift to the foundation, that is going to also be, um, you know, more, more green, if you will, that that's going to be appealing to, um, to philanthropists here in the Valley. Um, in fact, we um, have a new uh, environmental field of interest fund that will, um, once it once it launches, um, the, this grant making fund will focus on making grants to support environmental initiatives. And that fund in its entirety, um, as you might expect, is in the ESG portfolio. And that was very important to the folks who helped establish that fund, who made the initial hundred thousand dollar hundred thousand dollar gift to that to that fund. So. Um, so that's kind of been our journey. And again, um, I, I'm a person who really likes things to be black and white and um, divestment maybe appears more black and white than, um, than ESG. ESG, I feel like is still something that is evolving when it comes to um, feeling really confident that, um, that, that, that we know um, that we know that what we know what we're doing and we know that we're getting the desired impact. Um, but I think that for us, moving ahead, 
um, better understanding what these metrics and scores mean and also exploring other ways that we can be investing that other 95 and a half percent, if you will, that we can be putting those, those endowed assets to good use um, is going to be increasingly something that we that we as a board and as an organization are going to be to be talking about. Um, I think um, you know it really comes down, and this this really ties back, Molly, to your to your remarks about about um, the university. It's it's feeling good about what we're doing with the assets that we own, feeling like. The way that we are investing and deploying them are aligned with with our values and the values of our of our stakeholders, um, and ultimately doing the most good that we can. The most good both as we are investing them and as we are using the proceeds of those investments um, to provide support to our nonprofit partners throughout the valley. The challenge, I think, is around this definition of of what is good. Um, which which approach is good and and within an approach, how much of that approach is good enough? Um, and just having our goal be to to be continuously getting um, better and more um, disciplined perhaps about about how we how we draw the line with um, with the way that we handle handle our investments. Um, so I think I would just end with a kudos to Molly in that um, and and her her student colleagues um, in the divestment coalition, because I think if we hadn't about two years ago had a couple of donors step up and kind of, you know, wave in our face what some other community foundations were doing, I'm not sure that we would have launched this last spring. I'm not sure that looking into this would have would have um, you know bubbled to the top of our priority list. And so there is value in in being heard and um, engaging folks in in making sure that the people who are making decisions know that this is important to you. Um, and we saw that play out here at the St. Croix Valley Foundation. So that is our journey. Um, hopefully it's helpful. Hopefully I didn't talk too ridiculously fast. And I would love to see if um, if we have any questions. Thank you both so much. Uh, I think that's a great framework to see what students have done from a grassroots movement, uh, trying to influence foundations to what an actual foundation has has been able to do. And while divestment and ESG uh, do have their differences, they're, it's a positive step in the right direction. So I appreciate you both really laying that foundation out for us. Um, Heather, I wanna also say, I really appreciate your disclaimer. I think many of us in this conversation are not experts in investing. Um, certainly, I think from a student perspective, the ones that I work with at UW River Falls, we don't know enough about our foundation, what they do, we don't have the experience, and yet we're trying to ask them to, to do something different than what has historically been done. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a unique challenge as we as we try to move away from potentially what is the status quo and has been working for, for many years, um, trying to get people to uh, be willing to try mm -hmm. something new. So. It's really helpful to see to hear more about how you've done that with the St. Croix Valley Foundation. Uh, and I look forward to maybe seeing some of that data over the next one, three, five years. Yep. Um, and then seeing how many more people are are opting into that as well. I'm pretty excited about that. So uh, Kim will be plugging questions in here as they come in through the, the comments and chat function. Um, but I have a couple things I'll just uh, jump in right off the bat with. Um, so most of most individuals, you know, don't have a foundation. Those of us at the university, of course, we we do have a foundation, the St. Croix Valley Foundation's out there. But from an individual standpoint, do either of you have recommendations for what the average um, person could do either in their spending habits or their personal investing to move sustainability forward? Well, I, I, I'll start with, with a, a, a resource, Mark, that I'll share. Um, and, and again, um, it's, I didn't write it. It's on, it's at, on nerd wallet. Um, but there are some good resources out there. I'll give this one link that does, um, that do kind of just walk you through, Hey, if you're thinking about doing this, here's how to get started. Um, you know, t I, I think, um, invest messing with investments can be scary, especially if you're talking about your own retirement portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing if you've got millions and millions and hey, I don't need to worry about living on this when I'm 70. But I think a lot of people 
you know, they want to they wanna recycle, maybe they're trying to reduce the packaging that they buy in the first place, like they're doing those things perhaps in their own personal habits, but are a little or a lot more tentative to take the step and actually try to look at their own investment portfolio or talk with their financial advisor about, about moving some things. The reality is there are quite a lot, I mean, again, not perfect, but if you want to do something that's better than nothing, there are quite a few um, ESG funds out there with really low um, costs that, you know, if you ask your financial advisor about, let her or him know that this is something that you're interested in. Um, you know, they might advise you not to go all in, not to totally divest from fossil fuels. That might be their recommendation. I don't know. But if you're thinking that you're wanting to at least get started dipping your toes in the water, um, there are definitely some some resources out there that are focused on individuals. And so I will um, share and then hopefully, Kim, you can put that somehow back out there, um, the link to that to that nerd wallet, um, that nerd wallet listing. Um, but I think just starting with the terms and kind of getting your arms around what am I talking about here? Because this socially responsive divestment, ESG, I mean, you start throwing acronyms around and and people just get frightened and want to want to back up. Um, but I think maybe just to to think about is there is there, are there one or two things that really for you personally you are not okay with and making sure that you advocate for that with your financial advisor um, if you are using a professional or that you spend the time to really understand your own investment portfolio and and, and move move things around so that so that your your investments are aligned with um, kind of where your heart and where your values are. How about you, Molly? What would you say? I, I would definitely have like similar remarks, but I think sort of to add to that from like my experience as a student when I've been in like these conversations with professionals, um, I think that you, I think I have been surprised by the level of just sort of interest and just like the amount that people are like, oh, wow, like I just wasn't aware of that. I, you know, it's usually just, not, it's not something that's like this like very top topic around like you know, like, oh, like recycling, right? When we all talk about sustainability, like it's not one of those like top five things, like drive your car less, like, um, you know, and so it, it's usually just like an education at this point in a lot of ways. I mean, I think it's honestly also just like asking questions and and poking and just, um, I think especially like, it, it's probably obvious, honestly easier for someone who actually has and owns the funds. Um, you know, I'm a broke college student and I'm just advocating for my campuses. And so the level of respect and um, the amount that they have to listen to me is way less than someone that actually like owns the funds and owns the money. And so I would put that into perspective too. Like there is a level of respect in that conversation and that relationship that you build over time. Um, and I think that that's the biggest thing that I've learned um, is, you know, as I said, the, the campaign has been going on for two years. And I think the biggest, most important, successful thing that we have done is just build respect and build rapport. And so um, that can be reached a lot quicker with an individual who's deciding to divest. Um, so just keeping that in mind. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think also to remember that, you know, um, obviously you are you are focused as a coalition not only on just the environment, but on a very specific environmental issue around um, divestment from fossil fuels. And this responsible investing, this ESG, I mean, it covers a broad spectrum. I mean, for some folks, what might drive their ESG strategy is they want to invest in Black-owned businesses. Totally. You know, I mean, they want to invest in women-owned companies. And so um, so there, there's room under this umbrella to figure out kind of what's the thing that you care about and how can you put your money where your mouth is, whether it's you as a broke college student deciding that you're going to go out of your way to figure out which of the bookstores in your community are women owned and you're going to shop there, you know, as an example, or right. if at the other end, you're someone who does have a, a, a significant portfolio and who might choose to actually invest some of their dollars directly in, um, you know, helping build some of those businesses. So I think to, to remember that we've been talking today a lot about environmental issues, about, about fossil fuels, but there's really room for kind of whatever your passion is on that spectrum to think about how how you might put your money where your where your mouth is when it comes to your values. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'll just add in a little bit about UW River Falls and where where we've been at with this process. Molly alluded to some of it earlier. So my role at the university is I'm currently a sustainability coordinator. So I do kind of anything and everything sustainability related, which involves doing a lot of our sustainability reporting. There is a category in one of our reports that we do, the STARS report, that does look specifically at our investing uh, practices on campus. And 
we don't generally get a lot of data available. Um, but what I can say is from 2018 to 2021, we did see an increase in ESG reporting that are that came through the foundation. So we do believe we are slowly working in that direction. Um, but thanks to the UW Divestment Coalition, we actually passed a resolution through all four of our shared governance groups. We have a student government association, a university staff senate, an academic staff council, and a faculty senate. All four of those shared governance groups passed a resolution asking our foundation to to divest and to look at, at that and move forward. So um, it was great that we had a campus-wide response to do that. Um, Molly mentioned that the UW Divestment Coalition met with Janet Burns, the, the former president of the foundation. She's since left, and we just recently uh, filled that position. So I look forward to uh, revisiting or introducing myself to this new person and um, getting connected with her and letting her know what's happened over the last couple of years. Uh, certainly with COVID, everybody kind of had different priorities on campus. Um, so unfortunately, this hasn't been, you know, the the item that we've been able to move forward. But I do hope that um, we can both grow our ESG and start to entertain that conversation a little bit more of, of divestment for the UW River Falls Foundation, at least. So I'm very thankful to the Divestment Coalition. Again, I'm not an expert by any means, um, but the students doing a grassroots movement, connecting with all of the campuses, talking to the Board of Regents, um, that's really what we need to to help move things like this forward. So I'm very thankful for the, the divestment coalition. With that, we're almost up to our seven o'clock hour. So I just wanna put it out there. Anything else, Molly or Heather, that you'd like to add? Um, I think it's been a very, uh, very knowledgeable conversation on both of your parts. We really appreciate all the information you have shared, um, but any other advice or comments you would like to add? I can add something. Um, so I th I've been thinking a lot about this recently in sort of my sustainability conversations that um, I think that there's a lot alluding to at least recently in like my like age range about sort of the the despair and feeling that like individual decisions don't matter and that so much of you know issues related to climate are because of corporations and these things that feel like so large and out of out of our control and and I think that it's in some ways making us lose sight of the individual impact and the fact that, you know, societies are made up of individuals and the fact that we create, we create waves and we create change um, in our communities. And so, you know, if you are sitting here and thinking, well, I don't have a $4 billion endowment, um, that that doesn't matter. Um, I think that it is just as important that we create these change on the individual level, because, um, you know, we we create, we create what our realities are and we create our future. And so I just like to keep that in mind for people. And I try to keep that in mind for myself, just because it can be very overwhelming in general with sustainability to think that things are out of your hands and out of your grasp. But um, I think as individuals, we have a lot of responsibility to make these decisions, to be intentional and to, to live our lives mindfully and to, to be aware of what we're doing. And so um, we have the awareness, we have the internet, we see things that are happening. Um, and so I don't think we can point our fingers at just this far away, um, you know, man in a, you know, with a briefcase and a bunch of money that's that's causing all the problems. Um, and so I think I'll just leave it at that. Um, but yeah, I'm very, really excited for what the coalition has been doing. And um, I think it makes me very hopeful for the future. So thank you all for mm -hmm. having me and hosting. And um, I hope River Falls is doing well up there in the cold. Thanks, Molly. Uh, Mark, I guess I would just end, um, I would end with an invitation. You know, a few years ago when as a staff team, we were doing visioning with the St. Croix Valley Foundation staff um, and talking about kind of five years from now, what would it look like if we, if we had really gotten there? And one staff member said, Whenever somebody in the valley had a thought about, gosh, here's what I want to do to make the valley better, they would think, I should call the St. Croix Valley Foundation. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I really invite folks when I, I feel lucky, I get to spend a lot of my work days talking with people about how they can put their money um, in alignment with their values, um, both today, but often through legacy gifts. Um, and not that you always need money to make things happen, Molly, you are right. And sometimes when people do have some resources, it feels good to know that they can help make sure that those dollars are going to support the things that are not only important to them, 
but that are also going to take care of um, the communities that they've called home um, and that they love um, now and forever. And so I just um, invite when we talk about environmental and social and governance, you know, what's the thing that matters to you? Um, I would invite folks who are watching, if they've got a thought in their head, I would I would welcome their phone call, 715-386-9490. Call and ask for Heather. Thanks. Well, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'd like to just recap again the next two events in this series. So March 31st at 6 p.m., we have Diana Elfuth from the University of Wisconsin Extension talking about sustainable landscaping. And Molly used the word despair, which as I work more and more with students working in sustainability and climate change, there is that, that sense of climate anxiety and, you know, nothing that we're doing is good enough, uh, or that our individual action isn't going to have a large impact. Um, so it's good to have a reminder that the individual action does add up. Uh, but the April 21st event at 6 p.m. will feature Dr. Christy Manning from McAllister College specifically talking about the mental health impacts of our changing climate. So I know I'm very excited for both of those presentations, and I think the, the, the one on mental health impacts will be particularly relevant to students at UW-River Falls and our broader community uh, who have been experiencing the, the challenges of climate change. So with that, thank you again, Molly and Heather, and everybody else, have a good night. Thank you, Mark. Good night. Thank you.